Today I'm going to talk about my experiences of fuss testing kernels. Uh, my name's Kirk Russell. Uh, I live in Ottawa. Talk a little bit about myself. So um, I used to work at QNX Software Systems. It's Canada down the street. So I've spent a good decade testing POSIX operating systems of sort of an odd flavor, but um, still applicable to my experiences with BSD. Uh, recently, I was a Google SRE, so it was kind of interesting. Uh, at QNX, I did a lot of embedded systems kind of work. So you're working with one file system that's very precious. And then when I worked with clusters, it was a complete opposite environment where you had lots of machines and you know a few machines going away didn't really hopefully affect things. So it gave me a different perspective, definitely, of doing file system stuff. So first, a quick story. Uh, when I started at QNX testing file systems and kernels, I tried to leverage tools as much as possible to kind of get more bugs or get things going faster. And the kernel developers kind of revolted. They were upset. So one developer finally got the courage to come talk to me and he says, Kirk, he says, you, know, you find all these bugs and you know, they're very difficult to reproduce. And we've talked as a team and we think your power supply is broken. You know, <laughs> this is why you're finding all your bugs. So. I was kind of confused by that, so I went to help him and I could reproduce him on his desktop, obviously. So looking back, is I think I should have put more work into tools, not helping me, but helping the devs. But it took me a while to figure that one out. So I'll go over what I'm talking about today. So I'll define fuzz testing. I'll talk about why I think it's a difficult topic. Then I'll go through my ideas of optimizing sort of fuzz testing and how to help developers as well. Most of my examples are with FreeBSD. And things didn't work out as I expected, so I'll just go over some ideas I had if I was to do it again next time. So just investigating the terminology of fuss testing was kind of interesting. Uh, I wasn't sure what to call this, if it was um, what terminology. So one thing I looked into was there's an IEEE uh, standard for software testing and engineering. It's about the size of a telephone book. And if you read through it, everything's very formal sounding, the terminology. So if you find a testing term that sounds very formal, it's probably from this book. And then what I found was if, if there's testing terminology that isn't in that book, it, they, they, it sounds weird. The terms have obviously grown very organically. So the first term is, I think this is from the book. It sounds very formal. So it's a non-functional test. So if you're doing testing that doesn't trace back to like a requirement or some document, you're not testing features, you're, you're doing a non-feature test. So for example, for all the tests I talk about today, um, it's a successful test if I panic the kernel or get a core dump. That's a success. But that's usually not documented, right? You, I'm not saying how the code should work. I'm just trying to make a core file. So this is, by the mil spec, this is called non-functional testing. So I found a couple terms online for fuzz testing. Monkey seems to be pretty popular. It might be an East Coast, West Coast thing. Maybe monkey is California testing and fuzz is New York, I don't know. But they're both being the same thing. I think they're both all fuzz testing. You just somehow, you're taking some random operation, or you're fuzzing something, and you're just hammering the software under tests, and you're hoping for you know, something, a core file or something like that. So I think it's, I'll just say fuzz testing. I'll ignore monkey for now. So one last term I wanted to go over was exploratory testing. I think this is really powerful. So a lot of tests, if you read, if you follow the mil spec again, I'm not making fun of it, but if you follow the mil spec again, it's very formal. So testers write a test plan and they have to follow the rules. There isn't a lot of room for improvisation if you follow the rules. So I wanted to add that um, I think following the rules is good to script, but I also want to encourage testers or to experiment and try different things. So the goal is to call the, call the kernel. You should be able to experiment as well. So it should be you know, rigid enough to automate, but some freedom to do other things. So there's tons of different types of fuzz testing, right? It's a huge category. So I wanted to cover just one specific type, just kind of give an example of what I'm going to, to do today to the kernel or talk about. So I'll talk about structured, is, so I'm talking about structured interfaces or there's an, an API or there's a protocol. You know, there's um, something defined that the computer's going through. And so you have two choices when you fuzz. Either you kind of take advantage of what the structure is or you completely ignore it. 
So this first example is uh, I'm ignoring the data type. So th this script, I think at one time, uh, panicked NetBSD. Um, so I'm just corrupting the L file and running it, and um, eventually it causes a panic. But I'm not looking at the L file. Like, I don't know. There are probably some record I corrupted that was the magic. And I have no idea. And in this test, I don't care. So um, I'm not taking advantage of any of the interfaces. So that's one style of doing things. So here's a second style, is I, I am looking at the structure, I'm taking advantage of that. So one time I had to test an MP3 music player, and one of our customers was able to have, they had a magic CD that was able to crash our system. But they wouldn't give it to us, which is kind of funny. So I reverse engineered what was going on, and when I looked at the MP3 file format, I thought the music format was kind of boring. I didn't see the point of fuzzing it, but there's these metadata at the beginning and the end of the file that looked interesting. So that's where I focused my fuzzing on. And sure enough, I was able to make uh, 100 music musics with uh, corrupted files that reproduce the issue really fast. So for this interface, is sometimes there, I there is an advantage to really looking at the data and making a decision what you want to fuzz. So I'll just go over a bit of history of this. This isn't new stuff by any means. So the first one I found was uh, CrashMe. Um, I downloaded it from Usenet, the GitHub of the day. And um, when I used it, it was amazing. Um, any operating system I could find, it would, cr it would crash in 30 seconds usually. And um, so all it does is take a random stream of bytes and jumps to it. So you're just running random opcodes. So this is the file system exerciser. I think it came from Apple, but I could be mistaken. I remember when it, when it first got out in, I think, the FreeBSD community, there was tons of, of mailing lists about it. I think it was crashing NFS. Um, so this is, so CrashMe is definitely a non-functional test, I think. This one is a combination. It is functional, because it is checking that the return codes are accurate and the data of the file is correct. So if you're, if you're making a mistake there, this program will crash or stop and say, hey, the file is corrupted. But um, it also is, um, it will panic the kernel sometimes if you run it. So it is also a fuzz tester as well. This one's not that well known. Uh, it was a research project from the East Coast. Um, so what they decided to do is they focus on a function call or a kernel call, and they fuzz the parameters really exhaustively. And uh, an example is, I got that from the paper, is like they, they, they test live C calls as well. So if you take a string type, they'll lose all these strings or all the dates, and then they'll use, oh, it's a string, so they have all these valid and invalid strings. And then, oh yeah, string's a pointer, so they throw in all these invalid pointers. So this does find actually a lot of bugs in most operating systems, but I gave an example of the fuzz test is they really are functioning, they're really focusing on the one function and one function only. All right, so I'll talk about some of the problems I've seen with fuzz testing and what I kind of wanted to do with it that was different. So the first problem I've seen with fuzz testing is the pesticide paradox. So what happens when you write a fuzz test, uh, usually Im immediately it finds tons of bugs. You're exercising some pass of code in a different way. But um, over time, it's not effective. The, the bugs don't happen anymore. So going back to crash me is, you know, I remember running it 20 years ago and it would crash kernels in 30 seconds. But today, you know, I, I think it could run for days. I don't know who's run it recently, but you know, th those paths have been repaired. And the same thing with the file system exerciser. It had the same history. Huge buzz when it first came out, lots of bugs. Today, not so much. So if I'm going to invest my time in a framework, I want it to last for years and still find bugs. I don't want it to be a very short-lived tool. So I'll get back to helping devs. Is, um, I did some Googling on CrashMe, and the Linux journal said you know, 20 years ago that you had to run it for 24 hours as part of the release process. And I was just thinking that, you know, what happens if the corruption happens in the first hour? Right? Some data structure is now invalid. But the panic didn't happen then. Maybe it happens 20 hours later. Like, how long is it going to take you to reproduce? It's already got 24 hours cycle to run it again and see if it happens again. And even if you're using dtrace to capture things, that's going to be a huge log. So that's a lot of work, right? So the next thing I want to hit is like, complexity. So if you look at the CrashMe example with the 20 hours, like, a lot, that's too much data for a human to look at. I want it simple. So if I'm going to look at, at a fuzz test that successfully panicked the kernel, I kind of want to look at, at a set of operations that, that's one page or something that I can look at. And I, as a human, can go, oh, I know what's going on. I changed that code recently. Or, 
oh, that's that subsystem again. Like you, you want to make an educated guess to help you as a human to divide and conquer. You just don't want reams and reams of data. So I think it's separate from the time. It's, I want it less complicated. Uh, regression tests. So what I found with the crash me example when I used to do that at QNX is that, so you, you do have, let's say you have 20 hours for your cycle and um, you, know, you, you eventually fix the bug and it took you two weeks. If you're a kernel developer, I think you're exhausted. You're not going to take the time to go back and understand. You probably do understand what happened, you fixed it, but you're exhausted. You're not going to go back and write regression tests properly. It's just, it's, you know, it's done. So what I'd rather have, if it was simple and easy to start with, it should be in the, in the regression test right at the beginning. So you fuzz, you get something simple, then you put it in the regression test to start with. And then now you're just trying to fix it to get the test passing. So just a different model. That's my goal anyways. So I'll just go over the, the goals. Is uh, I want to resist the pesticide paradox. I want to re reproduce bugs with um, minimal time, minimal code. Regression test uh, savvy, I want it to be very easy to add to a test. All right, thought that this quote was applicable today if you had too many pints last night. But um, so some of my ideas have taken years to think about and the good ones are still there, so I just wanted to go over them. So when I was thinking about resisting the paradoxes, as programmers, you know, we're taught to reduce the complexity of our algorithms. And I thought about for fuzz testing, maybe that's the wrong approach. Maybe you need to do the opposite. Maybe you need to increase your complexity and that will help reduce the paradox. So this is a theory, I don't have proof of this, I'm gonna hand wave, but I kind of look at crash me and the file system exerciser as just big O of N. It's just, they're just sort of testing one space and it's a large number, but it's a finite number. It's not complicated, I don't think. So one model I'm gonna propose to increase the complexity of, of fuzz testing the file system is a Mad Libs approach. So Mad Libs is a, a, a children's game. You take a paragraph and you say, take out all the verbs and you, you shuffle them and throw them back in. So the sentence now is, is syntactically correct, but semantically it doesn't make any sense anymore. And kids think it's funny and they laugh at it. So I, I took that approach and said, how can I do that with the kernel, especially the file system? And I looked and really there's kind of two classifications of these objects. Is you have a list of objects which are you know, objects in the file, like the directories and files and stuff. But you have a list of operations. You have kernel calls that will take those objects. And I also make sort of more advanced operations where I just take common user cases and put them in a, uh, a large function. So, so I'm gonna argue this is more complicated because every time you add a new object or a new operation, I'm adding in more tests. So I'm gonna argue that this sort of increases the surface area of the code that you're testing. And I'm hoping this resists the paradox faster than some of the other fuzz tests. So I'm gonna give an example of some of the tests you're gonna find if you Mad Lib. And this one panicked the FreeBSD6 kernel. I'm picking on that kernel because it was pretty easy to, to fuzz actually, sorry. Um, so what we're doing here is I'm making a name FIFO on disk and I'm calling truncate on it. So with this version of the kernel, it panicked immediately. Um, I guess the first thing is I'm not functional testing so I don't care what this is supposed to do. But POSIX doesn't know what it's supposed to do either. So not a lot of help from the standards. Yes, I think you would probably get POSIX compliance with this. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so I'll joke about that more a bit. I actually did deeper of the unspecified stuff. So, but anyways, you don't want it to panic, right? Other than that, an error, an error code is probably what people are looking for. So I took a grep of the function specs in the single Unix specification, the two versions, and the number unspecified has doubled it between those two standards. So I guess my Madlib approach, I'm not gonna test that those undocumented things work correctly, but I think ultimately I'm gonna test that those calls don't panic the kernel. So let's, you know, let's 1,200 potential panic points that I could find. And I'm just doing it, you know, that the computers test that as far as I'm concerned. So anyways, that's my hand wavy argument that there's some benefit to this Mad Lib stuff. So I had this question, I had this slide in late because I got asked what am I exactly am I fuzzing? So it's probably worthwhile going through. Um, so I guess a, a, a story would be, if, let's say you run dtrace and you, you, you trace every kernel call. So you, you track all that, and all I'm really shuffling is I'm just shuffling the order of those calls, really. Um, some fuzz testers like Ballista, they put in all kinds of you know, horrible values. So you're kind of testing the exceptional pass, you're not testing the average pass. So I wanted to test that. I don't want to do anything more than what a user would do, but just in a bad order, I suppose. 
and mixing the objects up. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to exec things you're not supposed to expect, uh, expect to be executing, and I'm going to call every object and every call, so I'm going to try to get that kind of breadth. But other than that, that's, so just the order, what calls I'm going to pick, and the operations I give them, that's all I'm fuzzing, so mostly just ordering. There isn't anything, I don't, I don't try to keep it too complicated with weird um, addresses or stuff like that. Yes, system calls, and I also make advanced operations, like for example, um, seek and write. So I'll, I'll, there will be operations that I want to, exp um, that I know will cause problems. So it won't be a kernel call, but it'll be a collection of kernel calls that does something interesting. But I try to keep it simple. If you test, like I found with Ballista, if you test the exceptional cases, like I said, it's like crash me. You're going to get all these exceptions, but you're not going to get what an average user is going to do. Still interesting, but I think this might be um, better in the long term. So yeah, here's an example of the operations. So definitely any kernel call is, is my definition of an operation. I also use LD pr preload and I just pick a random file in my file system. Um, when I generate data sets, if I don't know what format it is, I'll put a, I'll try to make it a hash script that executes a file that's in the file system. So I'll try to sort of exercise that a little bit. Rename against directories is also fun to throw in. Um, creating holes, files with holes. I always call G-Core. I think it's interesting, it's calling a weird, most operating systems that call some kind of special API to make a core. So I always fill that in to generate uh, files. Open's great, it's got tons of flags. Uh, my favorite is truncate on a directory. I've corrupted so many uh, new file systems with that call alone. Uh, the developer, <laughs> usually you know, the dev comes back, well, it's, it's undefined what it's supposed to do. And I just say, yeah, I don't think we expect you to corrupt the file system. Uh, my math's a tough one because it confuses people. It's really easy to fuzz my map and, and have your software core, and that's expected if you're changing the size of your object and stuff. So I just make it simple, and I just look at the utilities and try to capture cases that the utilities are doing. So the three ones I found was um, AR, CP, and file use the map, and I just try to mimic what they're doing. So just regular user stuff. Um, file name links are special. I'll talk about that later. So I want to talk about development now. So I, I, if you're a developer, you should go, Kirk, you, you were going to help us. Why? You know, I talked about a lot of complexity here. It's not getting any easier for me. So what, how are you going to make this less complicated? So I'll get through this right now. So I'll kind of just go through the life cycle. If you're, you start testing on day one, and what are you going to do? The first thing you're going to do for your fuzzer is going to be spaghetti code. You're just going to write lots of code and keep going until you panic the kernel and go, ha ha, right? And you go talk to the devs and you've got a thousand lines of code and you don't even know what it's doing. So that's obviously kind of a fail. So usually the first improvement you make is you make an API and you abstract out the execution so that you focus on kind of doing your fuzz test. That's usually kind of the first improvement I've seen. So I think this makes the testing easier, but I don't think it improves the, the debugging at all. Um, from the testing point of view, you can definitely got the abstraction. But if you're a kernel developer, you still have to look at the big picture and get it working. So I don't think this works either. So I think this is one of the ideas that survived the hangover, is you, know, you just don't want an API, you want a file format in between the fuzzer and the execution engine. So it looks like this now. So the fuzzer is doing its job well, and is creating a file with random objects and random operations. And you have, you have another execution engine that does what it does well and reads those, that, reads those operations and just does what the file tells it to do. So I think this is a really good model. I swear I heard it somewhere before. But um, that was supposed to be a joke. That's the Unix philosophy. So where does it go? So how do you innovate now? So this goes back to my exploratory testing a bit. Is that now you've got a data set. You can do something to it. So you can write filters and modifiers on this data set. So let's go through an example. So you, you've got your tester, they're writing a huge complicated fuzz test, and they write to a data set, and maybe they run this nightly or something, and they panic the kernel. Cool. Well, that's, I don't want to give that to a developer at that stage. I'm going to try to divide and conquer. I'm going to try to reduce that set down to something less simple. So now you can innovate in your filters and modifiers and change that data set to tr try to find, like, maybe it's just one operation. Or maybe if you exclude an object, the bug goes away. So you know what's to do with FIFOs or something. And you can keep doing these filters until you get a minimal uh, data set, and then you can execute that. So that's, I think this is where, just following the Unix model, I think helps with this a lot. So this is the first algorithm I, I talked about. This is where I, I get my word, the, um, the competition, 
is, so I think when I started this, I had 100 operations in my sort of my database. And so the first idea of a competition was just split them into two archives. So put 50 in one, 50 in another, and just execute it overnight and see what happens. And if you get a panic, that's a success. So that archive is now sort of the champion. You found 50 operations, and whatever they're doing, that's panicking the kernel. If you don't panic the kernel, it's fine. You just regenerate the two archives again and keep trying. And if you had a, a cluster of machines, you would just keep doing this. Eventually, you're going to find one that panics the kernel. So that just goes to the algorithm I talked about. So I'll go over why I use the terms for this thing as competition and champion. And because actually, some of the comments I've got for this is that, well, you're not finding all the bugs. And I say, that's right, actually. So let's say I'm testing a kernel that, that I know is going to have three panics. I'm not going to find them all. I'm going to find the dominant panic with this. It's a game. I'm going to find one panic that, keep, that randomly gets through and becomes the champion. And then I'm, I guess I'm going to have to fix that one and then go back to the competition again and find the next champion. So the first iteration, you're not going to find them all. You're going to find the one. So it's truly a game. This isn't um, any type of coverage testing. You just keep looking for the next champion. So I'll go through, now I've had a couple ideas. I'll kind of go through the framework, or a summary of the framework. So I want it immune to the pesticide paradox again. I want to reproduce it in seconds, or use the, um, the filters and modifiers to get a test case that can happen in seconds, not hours. It should be very simple that I can understand what it's doing. Yeah, regression tests are great. Um, I'm a big fan of automation, so and and, in, and innovative, you know, uh, exploratory testing. But I definitely don't want this to be doing this myself. And I want to take advantage of of, of machines. Like I always felt hard doing this in a cluster because usually people don't like it when you crash the kernels in a cluster. But um, you know, if you do have machines and you don't mind that, then I should. Well, I want to use spare machines to try to uh, do more competitions at the same time. So in part of this playing around, I found some odd things. So I thought I, I'd just um, take a tangent and talk about a few, couple of the odd things I found while playing with file systems. Um, so I, I'm picking on FreeBSD 6 again. So in this example, I'm creating a file full of zeros, and I tried to exec it. So if this was a functional test, I would probably expect exec to return minus 1 with eno exec. Uh, with this version of the kernel, it panicked right away. So guessing from the error message, it's assuming underlying storage. But there isn't any, because I know from reading all the great BSD books that this is a sparse file. So there is no storage. So this is actually pretty gold if you're a tester, because what I found is a hidden object. So that's an object that the file system is doing for me under the covers that is a user I don't know about. So this is good news. All you do for this case is you go to your list of operations, and you make sure you're creating sparse files, and then you get end more tests. And then you'll find bugs like this. So for this case, this isn't a big deal, but Whenever you find a hidden object, take advantage of it and get it in your tests, because you're going to find bugs this way. So the second thing I kind of struggle with these kind of fuzz tests is what do you do with the file names? Like, do you just search the disk constantly and use the file names on disk? So you spend a lot of time you know, going down a tree. Or do you expect the fuzz tester to always know the names of the files? Um, I've tried both, actually. I think you just got to mix it up. I don't have an answer for this yet. But here's. Here's where the, the real hard part comes in. So this is not a BSD file system. It's a file system I tested in the past. They had three different algorithms based on the file name, based on the length of the file name itself. So short file names were stored one place. Uh, medium file names were stored in another. And ultra long names for Java were stored in a third place. And, and if you rename file, what happens? Like if you, if you start a file that's 300 and you shrink it down to one, does it stay in this, uh, that extended data structure, or do you delete it and go back to the first? Again, hidden objects, fantastic for fuzz testing. So, but where you have to be careful that if your fuzz tester is only generating files that are a length of 10, you're never going to hit all this wealth of, of uh, potential panics. So you just have to be attention. Like, I think the worst hidden object is the file names. So I haven't solved that yet. You just have to be aware it's happening if you're fuzz testing a file system that has this kind of stuff. So I guess the next question is, does this exist in the BSD file system, this kind of stuff? So I only found one case, and if there's others, uh, please ping me. Um, so there's, there's a concept, I call them short and long symlinks. If you create a symlink less than 120 bytes, I believe it goes directly in the inode. If it's longer, it goes to a block and disk. So 
So the same thing, if you're testing this file system, you're going to, you want to know that the lengths of the file names are going to hit this different path. So you've got to keep track of that. And I think that's the most complicated bit uh, for my testing is the names. Cool. So now I'm going to talk more about BSD. So Homer wasn't here uh, a few years ago at BSD Can. There was a talk about BSD is dead or something. So Homer missed that talk. So I think BSD is still around and it's great to use for research. So a few years ago, I attended Dr. McCusick's talk on journaling the fast file system. Um, I have to admit, I was kind of daydreaming during the talk. I apologize. Um, but what I was thinking was, this is actually a pretty complicated feature that's being added to the file system. This is a great opportunity for me to try out some of my ideas. The hard part of doing fuzz test and research against an operating system is if you can't find bugs, it gets really boring. So I'm kind of, I want to find bugs, I guess. So, so I ran home and said, great, this is an opportunity. I want to test this stuff. So my first pass was the, the, the sort of the naive fuzzer. Um, I just wrote a few operations, ran it overnight, and kept going. So I did use my Madlib approach, and I did have the idea of operations versus um, objects. I didn't have any data sets at this time. And uh, sure enough, I had 100 operations. Let's see, next slide, please. Yep. So my data set eventually had 100 operations in my library kind of thing, and I ran it overnight at eight hours, and I eventually got a panic in the Jira little soft updates. So I wasn't sure, so I disabled the feature. Yep, no problems. So I'm pretty confident now. Um, I've got a bug in the, in the software. Um, again, I, I guess I sound a bit morbid. I'm excited about finding the bugs. You know, it, it's just my job. But um, I did prove Dijkstra is correct. So programming is adding bugs, unfortunately. So it's kind of cool. I think in the old days when I was a junior tester, that would be it. I would go talk to the developer and say, good news, good news, right? I can reproduce a bug in eight hours, <laughs> right? Um, but now I, I, I don't think that. I want to try to do something different. So now it's time to write a data format now and see if I can do my modifiers and filters to try to do something interesting with this bug. So I, I followed this first, um, first kind of competition where I do the divide and conquer. So I took the 100 operations and split it to two sets of 50 and ran overnight. I'm trying to find the, the archive that's going to panic the kernel for the soft updates. And uh, then I've already reduced the set in half. So let's give this a try. And yeah, that worked. I was able to now to get an archive of 50 that's my champion. So again, if there's multiple bugs, I didn't find them. I'm, fi I'm, look, I'm, I'm now trying to trace down to this dominant bug. So I figured, how far can I go with this? So I split it again. So I had two archives of 25. I have my competition again. It worked. So now I have uh, archives of 12 and 13, and I ran my competition again. Um, and I was able to do this. I had an now I've, I was able to reduce it down to 12 operations. That takes five minutes now. So I've reduced it from eight hours to five minutes, and I've, delighted, I've deleted about 90 operations from my data set. So things are already converging down to something kind of, you know, that I might be able to understand. I'm not sure, so I've done some simulations where I'll add a, a fault to my library, and if it's one operation that's causing the core, this, this algorithm will go down to the one operation. So that I can't find a six, an archive of six easily kind of tells me this is a complicated bug. So this is a bug that Ballista is not going to find. So Ballista is going to fuzz one interface to death. It's not going to find what happens if you have state between multiple operations. So this fuzz test is unique that way that I am looking for these corner cases that are mixed between different operations. So I just make a, I just made a library of function calls. So usually, mo like ninety percent of them are just a raw kernel call that you pass in operations. About ten percent of them are like seek and write, or I'll set up um, like LD preload to point to a file and then I'll exact that file. So over time, I get more complicated operations because I know they're kind of already cases that cause the kernel issues. Does that answer the question? So mostly it's kernel calls, but it will also be a collection of uh, functions that I think are very interesting already. And I guess an operation uh, separate from the maybe reduced For my first generation, I just ignored the data. I let the, I let the operations create the data. Okay. But going forward, I'm. I should, answer, I should repeat the question, sorry. I haven't, this is my first time presenting at BSD CAN. So the, the questions are more about the operations versus the data. 
Um, so my first gener I, did, I ignored the data for this one. The data set only had the operation name. Um, I think I can prove that in the future. So I guess one example is if you wanted to exclude FIFOs from your testing, then you would go through the operations and just don't run the ones that make FIFOs. So you, you, the operations was the only nerd knob you could change. You couldn't really change the data, but you could eliminate the data by eliminating the operations. Does that answer the question? I can talk more after too. I know the terms are confusing. I did try to cover them. So even here, um, as a junior tester, I think this is still pretty successful. Now I can go to the kernel dev and go, you know, I can reboot this in five minutes. And I think that'd be enough. I think actually you'd be happy with that. But I wanted to keep trying. So I thought of a second, uh, a second kind of competition. And I'll use a terminology culprit um, that we used before for looking at if, you, uh, if you're maintaining a build system and someone checked in a bad commit, usually you'll say it turned red and you're looking for the culprit. So I use this culprit terminology is I wonder if I can go through this competition or this archive now and have a competition between each operation individually. So in the past, I was doing a competition between sets of operations. Now they're going to compete against each other. And I wonder if I can find something with that. So since I only have 12 operations now, I can have 12 data sets. And it takes five minutes usually to pan at the kernel. So this kind of testing can go pretty fast. So the first thing I did was I made an archive and of 11 operations, and I deleted the first op. So he's been, ex he's been excluded from this uh, competition now, and I run these 11 operations. And what happened here with nope is no panic happened. So what I kind of concluded was operation one is a culprit. So whatever this operation doing is, is part of the problem here. This is a good guy. We, I want him as part of my testing. So I generated the second archive, and I deleted operation number two, and that panicked the kernel in five minutes. So I'm going to hand wave and say, well, maybe operation number two is a no-op. Maybe it's not really needed in this set. Maybe you just got here by accident. So I ran the same competition 12 times, and the re test results are on the side. So I found four operations that seemed to be kind of essential. I think it was one, three, Four and nine. Yeah, I had it memorized at one time. <laughs> and uh, the, the rest of them I can kind of ignore. So I, st I still want to give this a try and see what happens. So I made the, you know, the super champion archive of four ops. And I ran that. And sure enough, now it's 30 seconds. So this is, this is exactly what I want to be doing. So eight hours, 30 seconds. And I deleted 96 operations. So on the next page, I'll go through them a bit. And I want to see. So here's the four ops that did it. Um, I want to go through them a bit and see if I can understand what's happening here. So I'm not sure what the link is there for. Um, the G core on the right, they're just creating files and putting data in it. Um, close is missing, so I'm not closing any file descriptors. And unlink is definitely very critical. So all I'm doing here is creating a file with a link out of zero. So I've deleted all the names in the file system, but the FD remains open. And you know, that, that's what FSIC does. If you, this file system is going to reboot, FSIC is going to go through and delete that file. And that's kind of the step you're trying to eliminate with the soft update journaling. So this passes my complexity test. I can kind of envision that this definitely sounds like a case that might uh, break with the new implementation. And you know, the developer can look at that too, probably make the same assertions and know where to look. So this passes my complexity test. And there's the bug that I reported um, with this issue. So. So I had some metrics early on about what I wanted to do. How well did I do with my metric? So I'm still hand-waving that this complexity is going to fight the paradox. Um, I definitely got this, this specific example down to seconds. The test case I definitely understand. I think this can be automated, especially if a cluster. I think you can do lots of competitions. Um, so where, where did I fail was, um, you know, I want to file the bug report now to, to a different open source project. So what am I supposed to do now? Like I got these four operations and I have my execution engine. I, if I filed a bug report saying use my execution engine, I didn't think that was going to get any traction. So um, that was a bit of a fail. It didn't, I guess I understand it as a regression test, but another, like one of the BSD communities may not understand this execution engine, which makes perfect sense. So what I did here is I just took this four operations and I wrote it in my own C program and I put that in the bug report to keep it simple. So I guess, um, so that's the one thing I didn't get is um, easy adding to a regression test wasn't as easy as I thought it was, actually. So going forward, 
I think one thing I would do is, is try to figure out, if you're going to test an open, if you're going to test the kernel on an open source project, try to find out what execution engine they're already using and see if you could use that instead of your own. So in the FreeBSD tree, there's, I'm going to say this wrong, PJD FS test. I think it was created for FF, ZFS testing. And it's already got an execution engine that's written in C. And it uses shell scripts to do stuff. I think I could probably either make a, a, a filter that would take my data set and convert it to this format, or I maybe could use these shell scripts already as my data format. Like, I don't know. But definitely, when you're working with an open source, you, you want to try to use their tools instead of you know, using my own. So this is something I would try if I was to do it again. And this is um, a second improvement was what the gentleman asked about the question is, I really cheated and I just focused on the operations and I ignored the objects in my data set. I think I could, I, I could probably do what Ballista does or maybe even just hook into Dtrace and get a list of operations and, and the type of parameters that way. And I could probably automate um, the generation of these operations a lot better than I did. I just hacked it together. So I probably could do more attention to that. Cool, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. There was a lot of detail for fuzz testing, so I appreciate your time. Any questions? Yes, Rob. So the question was, yeah, so the question was that uh, identified that most operations are just plain kernel calls, but sometimes you get a list of kernel calls that kind of are sort of, I think you call them a macro operation. Is there any automation for that? No, I just pay attention from my experience that I know this is a special, a special case, or when I find them in fuzz testing, like the, the sparse files, or you find that file names are something special, I just manually put that in and go, good, I'm gonna add that back in. So the tests get more advanced over time, I suppose. Up there, hi. No, I don't. I think I'm, I'm interested in keep doing research. I, I'll like to talk afterwards. Um, Yeah, that's what I thought with the operations. The other thing I thought is that things change over time. Like that panic, you know, at one point in time, this panic was probably pretty essential. But 10 years later, the code's going to change. So you have this C program that was written 10 years ago that panicked the kernel. You kind of wonder, is it, is it still valid? I felt maybe in, having a data format, you could at least convert it to something different maybe. You, you could at least have computers help you analyze if it's still a, a, a pertinent bug or not. That's featured research, but I thought of that as well. George? I have not. Wow. Good question. I guess if your goal is just to panic, um, I would do whatever it took. Because uh, sometimes the links going down adds, causes the panic, right? I've definitely seen out of order things cause problems because I had something going wrong. Um, I had to think about the networking. I'm more interested in the file systems. Um, <laughs> sorry. And there's also, and if you, if you do grepping on fuzzing for network, you get tons of hits. It's, it's obviously a very interesting topic for, for most people. So I, I play with the file systems because it's more of my interest. I'll go over there. Hello.
one. Yeah, I've experimented with that. I'll, go, I'll try to re-ask the question. So the question was, um, example was garbage collection. So what, hap what happens when you cause the corruption very early in your testing and at some time later that you eventually notice that you've corrupted a data structure? How can you do that with fuzzing? So I've got a couple approaches. One approach I've done is, um, so that's, so let's say you, you run your fuzz test and you aren't panning the kernel, the kernel. So I'd run that as a background test. Sometimes, so I'll just fuzz the kernel in the background. In the foreground is when I run, that's when I run the, the real functional tests. So you have tests that make sure all the kernel calls do things properly, and I run them in, in parallel. And I find that sometimes will trigger things, is eventually these functional tests that have passed 100% all of a sudden start to fail, and that's a good sign you've got corruption. So that's one technique I've used. And I guess, this, and the other trick was, do you have any tool? Yes, is, I didn't talk about it, but very often in my tests, I'll unmount the file system in fsicket and to see if, you know, maybe I've corrupted it on disk and I don't know it yet. That's still a valid, you know, panic in my condition. Uh, what other things I can think about? I think that's it. But sometimes you have to ask the devs for tools. Sometimes they'll say, I've heard, you know, the file system works. Why would you want a tool to go through it and, and sanity check it? And it's just for this reason, it's to make it easier for you. So, cool. Andrew? I have not. Um, if you Google for Crash Me, Google has done that. They've, uh, there's papers released 10 years ago where they're using Crash Me to evaluate uh, VMs. Um, the, the paper had a quote saying, uh, no VM can survive Crash Me for X number of hours. But that was 10 years ago, I don't know if that's still true. So I guess the answer is no, but there's other papers that have done that kind of stuff. If that answers your question, I don't know. Hi, David. Just a production kernel, yeah. Um, I attended the D-Trace tutorial this week and that's giving me some ideas. I think that, that could be played with as well. Ah, interesting. So change the error, not just a panic in a vanilla kernel, but add some diagnostic to the kernel and consider that a failure as well. So the question was, do I, what kind of kernel do I use? And I answered production and there's some ideas here to try to find bugs faster. I didn't think of that. Yeah, I could try it with it. Yeah, I think that's one of the advantages of having these filters. So the question was um, just a, a question of why I picked that linear algorithm instead of a different one. Um, so the, the answer was I was just experimenting. But that's why I like my approach of using the Unix model for this, is that you can write your own filter and play with it and do the same thing. Um, Hi. Delta? I have not, so I was asked, I don't know the tool Delta, no. Oh, cool. That's something. That's one of the good thing about presenting. So the question was, um, there's a tool called Delta that does exactly what I was doing. And this is great for presenting. I can learn new tools. Good. I'm gonna give that a try. Thank you. Any more questions? Cool. Thank you for that. That was some great information. I appreciate it.